image. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Paul's letter, his, what we call his first letter to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians. We told you last week as we introduced this study to you, written about 56 A.D. from the city of Ephesus. We're styling the, uh, the theme of this, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. And that's good news. That's, that's not a slight on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, on its, on its local visible congregations. That's a great word of encouragement. <laughs> The gospel is a message that saves sinners. And when sinners are saved by the gospel, the gospel making effectual in their lives, then they give evidence of that in repentance and faith as the Spirit gives them the new birth and, and are placed into local expressions of the visible church. And yes, we're called saints. But we're saints that struggle with remaining sin. We, we don't check the influence of sin, the battle of sin at the door of entrance into the visible church. We come into the church all struggling, saved by grace through faith, on our way to journey. And so Paul writes this letter to a church that, that was particularly perplexed <laughs> with problems. And I hope, my, my prayer is, as we study through this, that um, it'll be a source of encouragement to you to press on, not to give up, not to give in to the devil's lies when he points out your flaws, or someone else points out your flaws, or if your conscience simply smites you because you've discovered yet again where you're struggling, where you're battling. I want you to be encouraged that the gospel is the perfect message shared and demonstrated by the perfect Savior. And it's a word that's effectual and powerful, appropriate to imperfect churches and imperfect saints. Today we're going to look at verses 4 to 9, 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9, thanking God for imperfect saints. I want to ask you to stand with me if you would. Follow along in your Bibles. I do hope that you have your own Bible with you. If you don't have a copy of your, of your own Bible... Uh, see us after the service. We want to put one in your hands or make arrangements for you to have your own Bible. But just in case you found your way here without your own copy of Scriptures, we're going to put the text on the screen because I, I want you not only to hear me read it, I want you to see it. I would remind you, Josh gave us a good reminder a while ago, I want to remind you one of the reasons we read Scripture together every Sunday is because I think it's important for you to see it, hear it, and say it so that the word becomes more uh, helpful. And it's not a, the Bible's not a closed book that you stay away from because you don't know how to pronounce some of the words. We read it aloud. So follow along in your, your Bible or on the screen. As I read these verses, Paul's introduced the letter, of course, identifying himself as the author, identifying the, the recipients as the church of God in Corinth. He says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you were not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. What have I just read to you? I've just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Spirit use this passage today to remind us how as sinners saved by grace, we are called upon to relate to others sinners saved by grace and be enabled to thank God always for every one of us. Thank you. Be seated. 
If you know much about the letters of the Apostle Paul, he wrote half the New Testament, uh, you know that Galatians, we've studied through Galatians here in the past, it's the only letter that Paul writes where he, where he just goes directly into the issues at hand. In all of his other letters, uh, he gives greetings followed by thanksgiving for the churches. He expresses his intense feelings. He gives thanks to God for what God had previously done in their lives. The work of grace that God accomplished in Corinth while Paul was there preaching, we, we read last week as our response of reading Acts chapter 18, that's the, the section that talks about when the church in Corinth was founded. He's going to have to say some very difficult things to the Corinthian Christians. He's going, to, he's going to move soon into uh, chiding them for their, their divisiveness. They're, they're being divisive with one another. He's going to address their, their laxity, their, their complacent attitude toward immorality in the congregation. He's going to fuss at them and, for taking one another to court and besmirching the testimony of Jesus in their lives. And the way that they treating, are treating marriage, the Lord's Supper, the abuse there, the, the abuse of spiritual gifts, the fact that the resurrection of Jesus is being questioned in their midst. I mean, Paul has got some really tough things to say to this church. And so it's fascinating to me how he opens up. This thanksgiving he gives is not softening up for his difficulty. He is sincere in what he says. And so I, I want to take this to heart. And I want to challenge you today. As we go through it, ask yourself, is this my attitude toward the saints that make up the family of faith at Bethel? Because we're going to see in this four things. First of all, this, this idea of thanking God for the reality of his grace in imperfect saints. Secondly, thanking God for the riches of his grace in imperfect saints. Third, thanking God for the reach of his grace in imperfect saints. And then finally, thanking God for the reliability of his grace toward imperfect saints. Let's, let's look at this. First of all, thanking God for the reality of his grace in imperfect saints. He says in verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you. Because of what? Now, see, we would, we would want to say, I give my thanks to God always for you because you're so kind to me and we all get along and everything goes. No, that's not what he says, is it? Because that's not the reality of the corn. Or, by the way, in any local congregation. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Think about that a minute. You see, it doesn't matter how difficult we are with one another. I mean, we ought to repent of those things. It doesn't matter how different we are. If we have the common experience of grace, no matter what your background is, I think I told you last week, a week before last, that for Christmas, uh, Karen gave me a DNA kit. At long last, she summoned up the courage to find out just what in the world is the background that makes you tick the way you do. I'm grateful those things were not available when I proposed to her It doesn't matter how different the background is. How you were raised, where you were raised. If you have received the grace of God, if you can mark a time in your life, and I realize when I say this, I'm speaking to some here who cannot do this, can mark a time in your life when you were brought from, from death to life, from darkness to light, from blindness to sight, from slavery to freedom. If that's, ex that's your experience, so that you believed in Jesus Christ, that he is the only Savior of sinners and yet is the willing and able Savior, Savior of all who will come to him. If you've had that experience, then that experience of grace supersedes any differences we might have. We, when we studied through Ephesians, and remember Paul is writing this letter from Ephesus, 
When we studied through Ephesians, we looked at that chapter 2 passage where he says, For he himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has torn down the middle wall of partition that separated the two. Let's talk about this. The Gentiles and the Jews were separated by the ceremonial law. We're looking at that on Sunday nights, by the way, as we're going to an overview of all of the scriptures. And he says, in the cross of Jesus Christ, that the ceremonial law, this, this, this writing in commandments and ordinances that was, a, that was to check us as, as the Jews, he would say, and to hold the Gentiles at bay, that he nailed that to the cross and he made of the Jews and Gentiles one new humanity making peace peace with God peace with one another in other words the cross of Jesus Christ when it's embraced by you and embraced by me should be enough for us to have the grounds and the means and the basis to have peace with one another be reconciled to one another brother Norman and I were talking about this this morning before the service that when when if when we get at odds with one another, if we don't reconcile, we're basically denying the cross of Jesus Christ. We're saying, no, it's, it's not sufficient for this issue. Paul says it is. So he gives thanks to God for these Corinthians. Because of the, and he says, I give thanks to my God always for you. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. That's, that's a lot of grace. People from the house of Chloe came and told him, you won't believe. It. They are, there are people there that are, that are picking sides. They're saying that you... Or a better preacher than Apollos and Apollos. Some are saying Apollos is a better preacher than you, and some say Peter's better still. It's a mess. You know, you can imagine Paul as a Jew going, Oy vey. What is, but he says, I thank God always for you. And they came with all these different reports. And then a letter came to him asking about the gifts, the spiritual gifts. And he says, in all of that, I thank my God always for you. And the basis. So here's my challenge to me, my challenge to you. Can I, will I, will you thank God always for each of the saints who make up the household of faith that we have given the name Bethel Baptist Church because of the grace of God that is in me, that is in you, that is in them? So that's, that's the basis. And there were interesting people there. There were folks, remember I told you the temple of Aphrodite is in Corinth. A thousand temple prostitutes were there for the pleasure of the worshipers. And some of those temple prostitutes had been saved and brought out of that into the body of Christ. There were people who were homosexual who've been saved and brought into the body of Christ. And we're going to look at this list in, in 1 Corinthians 6 when we get there. But just look at verse 11. He talks to me, he says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. It was an interesting mixture of people. And yet he said, I thank God for all of you. Second thing I want you to see is thanking God for the riches of his grace in imperfect saints. He says in verses 5 to 7 that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. There were two gifts highly prized in Greek society. Speaking, the ability to, to communicate truth as they understood it, and knowledge, being able to grasp truth. Dr. Curtis Vaughn, my Greek professor in seminary, cited one of the commentators that he introduced me to, <coughs> Moffat who rendered the verse this way, In him you have received a wealth of all blessing, full power to speak of your faith, full insight into its meaning. He says, Paul says, in every way you're enriched in him, in all speech and knowledge. Paul's giving thanks to God for the grace 
shown to them in Jesus Christ. Because when the gospel comes, there's an enriching. There's an enriching. You see, you go from being poor in spirit to being enriched with something to say. Everybody has a testimony. Everybody has a testimony. And we go back to the song we sang. Breathing in your grace, breathing out your praise. You know, we may even sometimes go, I'm just going to, I'm going to hold it in. I'm just going to hold that, that testimony in. I'm just going to... But you can't do it very long. You've got to exhale. You've got the praise of God. It doesn't have to be eloquent. But if you've been brought from death to life, you know that. And you want to tell people about that. It, it will come up somehow, some way. You're, you're enriched. You were poor. Even the man born blind in John chapter 9, who, who had not been a follower of Jesus Christ very long at all, when you look at that narrative, they're pressing him and pressing him. Well, tell us about this man. What, how could this be? And he said, man, I, there's a lot that I don't know, but here's what I do know. I couldn't see. Now I can. I was blind, but now I see. John Newton picked up on that in his wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Enriched in that, if you've been saved by grace through faith. And knowledge. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would come. In John's Gospel, as we were looking at that back uh, on Sunday evenings going through uh, learning discipleship from Jesus, the, the ultimate disciple maker. Jesus said, it's necessary that I go away and send you the comforter. And he will lead you into all truth. He will testify of me. Paul writes of this troubled church where they couldn't agree on which preacher they liked best. They couldn't agree how to handle immorality in the congregation. And on and on and on. Now, I want to recite that enough in the course of this that you're going to, you're going to recognize it, and it's going to be the bigger picture. You're going to go, oh, my goodness. This people, this, this group of believers in Corinth is a church? And he says, you've been enriched. In what way? Verse 6, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. The testimony about Christ. This, this gospel that he preached, that they received, and as they received it, they shared it with others. As they received it, it became the stack pole around which they rallied and gathered. The testimony of Christ was confirmed among you with all the problems. There were still marks that it was the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and his testimony the word about him, which is what it's all about here. It's a lot of things. We study through a lot of things. We have go through books of the Bible in Sunday school, go through books of the Bible, typically here, sometimes thematic. But it's all about Christ. Because if we don't make it all about him, then it doesn't matter what we make it about. It just becomes speculative knowledge. And Paul said, knowledge, just knowledge, knowledge as the beginning and the end, puffs up. The testimony about Christ humbles. Testimony about Christ levels the playing field. We're all sinners saved by grace. He says the result of this in verse 7 is so that you are not lacking in any gift. And there's some irony here because when he gets to chapter 12... <laughs> And 14, he is going to take them to task about how they are handling the, the, what we would call the remarkable gifts of the Spirit. You're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's not so much interested in talking for talking's sake or knowing for knowing's sake, but as as knowledge comes and as words are shared, 
It is about doing. The gifts, the charismata, the gifts of the Spirit are about doing. He'll tell them. Later on in 1 Corinthians, they're for building up the body. They're for strengthening one another. They're for blessing and edifying. You see, 1 Corinthians 1.18, we're going to be getting to that. Paul says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel is power. Power to bring a dead sinner to life, power to give sight to a blind sinner, power to set a sinner free from the bondage of sin and death and hell and the grave and make them free to follow Jesus Christ. That great hymn, And Can It Be, that we sing from time to time. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused, that is, thine eye gave a quickening, a life-giving ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. But don't miss the next line. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Paul would say to them later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That's the only testimony that Paul's interested in, is that which demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit to change lives. And he said it again in 1 Corinthians 4.20, just one more time. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. I told you before my friend David Sitton, David spoke here years ago, who trains missionaries to go to unreached people groups, was the first one that ever had me, got me thinking about this. He said, Bill, he said, you realize, don't you, that the, that the idea of convincing people with fine arguments is a Western thing. It's not a global thing. When you go around the world, going among peoples where the gospel has not yet come, they're not interested in your fine arguments to make a case for the truth claims of Christianity. He said they're convinced by one thing, power. Guess what? In a post-modern world that we live in, in a pre-Reformation climate that we live in. Do you know what influences people in our culture today? Whether they would consider themselves learned or unlearned is the powerful demonstration of the gospel in your life and in my life. Because they live powerless. And when they see someone who's been granted power that defies understanding of how you cope in a culture like this, that either attracts them or stirs them to anger, but they do not ignore it. It's in power. One commentator I read said that the, the Corinthians prized knowledge because they believed it gave them access to the divine mysteries, a form of, of Gnosticism. Paul tells them that they're the changed lives of the Corinthian believers, that that's the convincing case for people in their city to consider who Jesus Christ is and what he's come to do. Look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. This closing of the opening verses, that, that hymn, that Trinitarian hymn that Paul opens Ephesians with. He says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We looked at this Wednesday night in our, on our, in our study through the, the names and titles and descriptions of the Holy Spirit in our prayer time. The promised Holy Spirit. He seals us. 
And you can take the seal a lot of different ways. The, the picture here is that of a signet of a, of a ring where a letter was written and, and, and wax is put over the seal of it uh, to, to close it. And then a, a ring is stamped that shows the authority that this comes from one with authority. To pay attention to it. The seal. Well, quickly, the third thing I want you to see is thank, thanking God for the reach of his grace in imperfect saints. Notice this. Again, you're going to see the mess that is, that is Corinth. But notice what he says about them. Not only does he thank God always for them, for the grace of God shown to them in Jesus Christ, but he, he's confident who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it would be very e easy for Paul to focus on the guilt of the conduct of some in the church in Corinth. In fact, you don't even get the in indication that these, all these different problems are problems manifested by the same group. Paul doesn't write like that. He writes about the different problems. But he says, I'm confident, so confident am I of the grace of God in you that I give thanks always to God for you when I remember, because I was there, Paul was there when Corinth had no body of believers, had no gathering of a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw the transformation. He was there 18 months. He saw the church birthed, coming together. I know what it was. I know what it became by God's grace. And he says, and I know you got problems. Chloe's household has told me. <laughs> the letter has spoken to some things. Be assured of this. And this is so critical when you're struggling. When you're struggling with your own sin or when you're struggling in a congregation where it seems like that sin pops up frequently, God will sustain you to the end. Jude says, to him who is able to keep you from falling. So the question comes from time to time when you're talking about these things. Well, which is it, Pastor? Is it, are we supposed to persevere to the end, or does God preserve us to the end? And the biblical answer to that is yes. And one of the most infallible marks that God is preserving you is, guess what? That you are persevering. Because he says he will sustain you to the end. Not coming in to glory, not coming before the, the bima, the, the judgment seat of Christ tattered and torn and no guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ because remember Romans 8 in that section when Paul has strung together that glorious chain of grace all the links in that chain he says what should we say to these things <laughs> he says here's what we say if God is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely along with him give us all things? Who shall lay any charge against those whom God has chosen? Verse 33. It is God who justifies. How can I be sure? How can you be sure that, that with all your struggles, with all your frustrations, with all your fallings and failings and frailty, that you will stand before God and hear those words, come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because God, who judges, is the same one who justified you. You see, the glorious truth of doctrine of justification by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone is that, that I don't need to justify myself. In fact, I can't. That was the Pharisees' problem, by the way. They were constantly trying to justify themselves, and Jesus had very little patience for the Pharisees. But those who would look in his eyes as he, as he journeyed this earth, knowing their guilt and looking to him with the hope of forgiveness, always met with forgiveness, always met with mercy, because they realized they couldn't justify themselves. That it's Christ who justifies the ungodly who declares us not guilty and accepts us as righteous. The worst sinner you know, the worst you have been, is not outside the reach, the grip of God's grace. It's good news. 
for an imperfect church. J.B. Phillips said of, of this, he will keep you steadfast in the faith to the end so that when his day comes, you need fear no condemnation. The way that, the very way that and can it be ends. No condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ, my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would you die for me? Thanking God for the reach of his grace. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You may know people who at one time in their lives, as Bunyan describes, were what they call fair, flourishing believers who've gone by the wayside. And you're wondering now, are, are they saved? Were they ever saved? Let me tell you something. If they belong to him, his reach extends to them. That's one of my favorite preachers said years ago, decades ago now, he said, you know, Bill, he said, God, it may take God sailing the seven seas to lay hold of someone you love, but when he gets his hooks in them, he will boat them. He will. It's inevitable. You don't know anybody breathing right now. You don't know anybody who has pink under the fingernail, which is a sign of he's alive, that is beyond the reach of God's grace. And that's good news. And it helps you, by the way, look at fellow sinners in a church and have hope that grace is there. And then finally, thanking God for the reliability of his grace toward imperfect saints. We, we sang, great is by faithfulness. Listen to what, how Paul styled this. God is faithful. That's it. When we are faithless, John says in one of his letters, he is faithful. God is faithful. By whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son. We looked at that word called last week when he opened his letter, when you summoned. If you're saved by grace through faith here today, you have been summoned. And you can't, Brother Norman served on a jury, got jury duty recently. Did it ever cross your mind and say, ah, I don't have time for that? No, it's a summons. You ignore it at your peril. You don't respond to a summons, guess what? You get to be one of the next cases. That's the word here. God is faithful by whom you were summoned into the fellowship, the shared life of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, here's the beauty. If God has saved you by grace through faith, he has committed to bring you to the end. Yes, because he loves you, but more so because he loves his son who died for you. More so because his very name, the integrity of his name is attached to you making it home to glory. That's what Paul wants this church to know as he begins to do apostolic pastoral surgery on them. God's faithful. He'll sustain you. So if you're saved by grace through faith here today and you know that you're imperfect and you realize you look around and it doesn't take you long to look around and realize you're in an imperfect church. In fact, you can all you do is just look this way. Look right up here. You're going to know immediately you're in an imperfect church. You have the confidence. God's going to bring us home. But if you have not yet followed Jesus Christ here today, you're yet sitting in debt in your trespasses and sins. You may have heard every word I've said. They may have come into your ears, rattle around in your brain somehow and, and making, making some sense or no sense. But you see... If you're not yet saved, then none of this that I've just read is true for you yet. Though it can be true for you if you will simply, by faith today, repent of your sins. Trust Jesus Christ, his life, sinless life, his death, dying on the cross in the place of all who will put their faith in him. 
His burial, His resurrection. Simple, childlike faith. Yes, Lord, I believe. As a sinner worthy of your condemnation, I believe. Save me. Then everything I've read today is, will be true of you. Everything I've read. And you, as you confess faith in Christ, will become part of an imperfect church with a perfect gospel given by a perfect God who perfectly intends to bring all for whom Jesus died home to glory. What a glorious truth. Who can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? The biblical answer is nobody. Nothing. Because God's name is on this matter. The integrity of his son is attached to this. So I want to challenge you as saints today to live dealing with remaining sin. We're going to be talking about that, how you deal with that, how I deal with that, putting it to death. Throwing a blanket of love over those who are struggling with their remaining sin. Inviting all we know to come and join Perfect Church. Imperfect Church. There is no such thing as the Perfect Church. The Imperfect Church. For imperfect saints. But the promise of a perfect God. That the gospel is the power. That's all you need. That's all you'll ever need is a powerful gospel to save you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're so grateful for your love for sinners. And Lord, I read this passage in 1 Corinthians and just am reminded again, and I need to be reminded constantly that I not look to performance, in me or in my brothers and sisters, but to look to the performance of Jesus Christ as enough, that I need to deal ruthlessly with my own remaining sin and deal tenderly with remaining sin in others. And help, well, I pray that that will be the model that we will all adopt here. So that those who come among us keenly aware of their struggles will not mistakenly think that we have got it all together here, that that they're not, they're not worthy of joining with us or becoming a part of us because somehow they're, they live at a standard below us and we've, we've managed to, to reach heights that, that are rare. Lord, may we not ever convey that. But as one sinner saved by grace to another sinner saved by grace, as one, one beggar who was starving who's found bread, giving bread, the bread of life, to another beggar who needs bread, help us, God, to be such people, to model for folks that their hope is in the perfect gospel, and that it's offered to imperfect people. We ask this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.